What's up, language peoples? I am your host and interpretive guide, Mike Minna. And today we're going over a fascinating chapter by Mary Buckles. Um, this one's entitled, On Being Called Out of One's Name, Indexical Bleaching as a Technique of Deracialization. And it's found in this book, Racial Linguistics. Okay, so this is a complex issue. Um, and I have a personal, I feel a personal connection to this chapter. Uh, my name is Mike Mena. Mike me na and since moving to new york i've heard my name pronounced the way i like about one time um but i've had to think about this deeply um is this a battle that i want to address now all my white professors um all the ones that i've had in class anyway um say my name mike mina mina um ultimately i decided that i needed to let this go because it required me telling them in front of the class, you know, a challenge to authority. Um, and that would have been the time to do it, not after class, not before, or maybe it should have been before class, but, you know, what are you going to do? Um, but it kind of needed to be in front of the class because after that point, without fail, the other students thought my name was Mike Mina. Um, but then another time, it wasn't a white professor, it was, a, it was a black woman professor, one of my personal heroes, and honestly, I just respected her so much that I'd never say anything to contradict her in front of, in front of a classroom. Uh, I, just, I just wouldn't do it. Um, so after a while, you know, I just accepted it, and finally when I heard my name pronounced the way I like by a Latina professor, um, I realized that it was just... It was more than just my name. Um, it made my name sound like who I am, which is Mexican-American, or I like to say Texican because I'm from Texas. Um, so here we have issues, overlapping issues of race and institutional power. So even a minority person in, a, in an elite position in society, a PhD student, um, can be can be positioned to feel powerless in an institutional setting, um, even with a professor that is likely racialized in society as black. So this is a complex issue. Now, let's get into the chapter. So she opens with that K and Peel skit with the black substitute misnaming white students, right? So part of what made this funny was the responses from the white kids. Um, but what I also found interesting is that the young white students felt an unquestioned ability to correct someone. Um, they assumed a certain level of immunity in correcting an older person in authority, a black person in authority, as if whiteness alone superseded various forms of authority. Now, I would guess that within the video, uh, this is a comment on differential power relations uh, rooted in race. And like I said in my opening story, I could not respond because of the overlap of race and institutional power. But to be straight, um, the inability to respond is what happens more often than not. Now, when I was a high school teacher back in the day, um, when I couldn't pronounce names in Spanish of some of my students um, from South Texas, that was perceived as borderline absurd by students because I, as a fellow Mexican-American, fellow native to the area, should just know. But sometimes it would pass without response um, even though I knew that I had clearly messed up a kid's name, uh, but I would just move on as if it didn't happen. Now, in this chapter, um, Buckholtz describes various processes that happen in the moment of what she calls renaming, denaming, and misnaming of students um, that have names perceived as difficult to pronounce. 
So she she describes this as a form of linguistic violence, or she uses Judith Butler's phrase, injurious speech. Um, so right away, we got to kind of pull a little bit of knowledge about what we know um, about Judith Butler. So we know from her and from others that language performs social action. Uh, it affects the world. It changes stuff. It has the power to interpolate. What does that mean? Interpolate. Um, it's pretty complex, but most scholars say it's language that brings into being a kind of political subject, or it hails into existence a subject position. Hails, as in calling into being. For example, give you an easy example, sort of. The language, with the power invested in me, I now pronounce you man and wife, or wife and wife, or life partners, or husband and husband, etc. Now, notice the phrase, with the power invested in me. That is, the authority perceived to be held within the language and the person, as well as the institution connected with that person. It's perceived that that language brings into being a political position or a political subject. For example, husband and wife. But interpolation can happen much quicker than that. So a cop yells at you on the street, you know, stop. Now, notice they didn't say, with the power invested in me, I command you to stop. It's just, you know, stop. Um, but perhaps their voice interacts with their uniform or the fact that they have a gun, right? So, okay, you stop. You're brought into being as a person that interacts or is under the authority of the police. You are brought into being as a political subject. For example, a citizen of the state. So similarly, like the marriage example, you are brought into being um, as a state-recognized husband and wife, or wife and wife, or life partners. Um, and that doesn't just happen at the moment the, the uh, person in authority speaks. You're also interpolated by all the government documents that describe you as part of a contractual partnership. So your interpolation keeps on going and going and going. Interpolation happens at various scales, instantaneously. Um, but essentially, it's about being positioned as a certain kind of political subject, um, and often a racialized subject. So we're dealing with a lot of affected scales just in the act of naming someone. So what happens in that moment of, mis of misnaming? Um, because Bacoltz is saying um, it's not just simply a mispronunciation of letters. Misnaming has the potential to interpolate students as a kind of political subject. Or more importantly, it has the potential to call into being a subject that occupies a subordinate position in society. Uh, so this is where we get to that term, indexical bleaching. Um, so she says names, uh, this is page 274. Names are indexical forms with social meanings that are intimately tied to the context of their use. It's 274. Um, so names index. Like our index finger, names point to a lot of stuff, point to different meanings. For example, the name Mikey. Uh, it points to gender. It probably points to a certain age range because I don't imagine there are too many, you know, 60-year-old men that go by the name of Mikey. Um, but also, 
we got the it, we got the fact that it's in it's being mediated through the English language, which probably points to Americanness. But other names might point to race or ethnicity. For example, the name Juan. Um, now, she says it is possible to strip away some of these indexes, what she calls indexical bleaching. For example, the hyper-anglicizing the name of someone could lead to what she calls deracialization. So, I imagine she intends indexical bleaching to be more of a more general semiotic process. So while I thought she was going to say that it whitens, um, I think she's just going for a more general stripping of indexical meanings. So essentially to deracialize is to reposition a student's name as potentially normative. Although um, we should be aware that American normativity is almost always based on whiteness. So, misnaming is not just mispronunciation. It strips away meaning. It strips away history off a person's being. And here's the kicker. Only some racialized bodies get away with it most of the time. So, the black substitute in the K and Peel skit did not get away with it. I, as a Mexican-American teacher, did not get away with it. But holy shit, do a whole lot of white people get away with it. Now, let's not focus so much on the intent of speakers, because I imagine nobody intends to hurt anyone. Um, you know, most of the time. It's, it's probably not teachers. Uh, but if we focus too much on the intentions of speakers, then we end up making just a whole lot of excuses for misnaming. But in this chapter, um, Buckholt reminds us that there is much more happening when we misname someone. And as teachers, or as persons with a different access to power, we should be aware of what we're doing. Um, students may end up being pushed into political positions that they don't want. For example, a person could be perceived as foreign or immigrant, or maybe in high school where kids are really fucking mean sometimes, maybe they're just weird. Maybe they have a weird name. Um, in other words, they are interpolated as other. Capital O, other. Okay, so now when I do these videos, I refrain from critique, and I am more interested in what these concepts can tell us about various scenarios. Um, while I was reading this, I've read it a few times, I immediately thought of two scenarios that seem to pose a problem to this idea of indexical bleaching, or it at least complexifies the idea of indexical bleaching. So I'm going to give you two examples that I wonder how indexical bleaching can help us. Okay, first scenario. Now, I told you about my professors mispronouncing my name all the time. Um, my white professors. What if I told you that I perceived that not as deracialization, but as an explicit moment of whitening, especially from white professors that I didn't know? But, but, big but, I absolutely did not feel the same when my black professor changed my name. There was something qualitatively different in that experience. So what's going on there? Yes. Yes. Okay, second scenario. 
Um, so I'm from South Texas. I met a really good white teacher that wasn't from the region of South Texas, from that region. Um, she took the time to pronounce everybody's name uh, correctly in Spanish. She even learned Spanish to talk to parents. Um, so good teacher. Really, really good teacher, like on top of her shit. But she would also lecture her junior high students on how to correctly pronounce their name in Spanish. Now, keep in mind, this area is 90% um, Latino, Hispanic, Mexican descent, whatever you want to call it. 90%. Now, this is a white person coming in to correct the way the kiddos, junior highs, junior high kiddos, were pronouncing their name or what she perceived as mispronouncing their name or maybe even whitening their name or deracializing their name. Now, here's the thing. Sounds, she obviously has good intentions, right? Her Spanish did not sound like the regional Spanish from the area. It sounded, um, it sounded Maybe the word is exaggerated, perhaps overpronounced, perhaps over standardized for this particular area in South Texas. Um, so to me, her Spanish didn't sound the way uh, the Mexican Americans there would actually pronounce their name. So that was really interesting. What do you think of that scenario? Maybe you can offer some comments below. Um, I'd love the, I'd love to see someone apply this indexical bleaching concept um, to these scenarios. But like I said, it's complex. I'm not gonna say what I think about these scenarios. I do have my thoughts, um, but I'll let you guys talk about it amongst yourselves. Okay, so thanks everyone. My name, Mike Mena, Mena, Mena. Till next time, follow me on Twitter and academia.edu. Uh, don't forget to like this video. Until next time, I will see you guys around.